Now, let's get our third panel underway. The topic of our next panel is one that some, can sometimes be hard to talk about, but also one that uh, most covered to guarantee the success of your operation. Our panelists help producers around the state work through with those tough decisions every day. Jack Davis has worked with producers for 23 years in his role with South Dakota State Extension. He currently serves as the Crop Business Management Field Specialist. Stephanie Judson grew up on a farm north of Pierre. She is currently the president of the South Dakota Community Foundation. In her position, Stephanie oversees strategic vision, donor relations, and grant programs development. Stephanie and her husband have two sons. Will Walter is the director and instructor for the Farm Ranch Business Management Program at Mitchell Technical Institution. Institute. Will is a native of Howard, South Dakota. Will and his wife started their own livestock and grain operation and are now transitioning some of the labor and management to two of their children. Would you please welcome Jack, Stephanie, and Will. Thank you. Thank you. And let me get, make sure this is, oh, you got me going. All right. So, okay. Well, just uh, contact information, and I think these slides will be available to them. Or, uh, it's, it's pretty simple. It's just a name at sdstate.edu. And I'm right next door to, to Will and at Mitchell Tech. Our, the Mitchell office is on, on their campus, so easy to get a hold of. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do is first uh, really congratulate all of the farm and ranch business families that are taking part today either here or, or watching online. You know, it's one of the toughest management things on earth to make that transition and keep the family business going. And many in South Dakota have reached that maybe fourth and fifth generation. And, you know, a lot of them are looking at 125 years or 150 years of being in a family business. So I think they really deserve uh, congratulations for, for being able to do that and making that commitment to, to being producers and keeping it in the family. So um, there's three of us as SDSU Extension Economics Field Specialist. Uh, I'm in Mitchell, uh, Heather Gessner is in, in Sioux Falls, and Shannon Sand, who is here today, is in, in Aberdeen. So those would also be contacts for you that uh, work with transition planning and, and farm business economics. So if you have questions, there, there is their contact information also. Uh, we have, a uh, quick plug, we have a program coming up that'll be a little more detailed. You're just gonna get a few things today and hopefully maybe pique your interest. But we got one coming up September 14th in, in Sioux Falls. There's not much detail out on that. Just uh, mark the date down we'll have a, a day of uh, estate planning and management suggestion succession breakouts uh, during the day. So that's coming up. Look for information on that within the uh, few weeks or so. So one of the things that, that I like to think of um, is, is deal with it in systems. You know, if you can, and they're combined. And if you think of it, there's a, the family system and the business system. And they both uh, need plans. And they need long-term plans. And yet they got to work together. And a lot of the conflict that takes place, ah, how would they do that? All right? Is there a pointer? Bottom? Middle? Okay. Is where the, those two intersect. And you have to learn to, to manage that. It's not something maybe that, um, the, that you can have set policies with, but you gotta manage through it. There maybe isn't a yes or no answer. It's a gray area. Because there's gonna be that pull where it has to get, maybe go more towards a business first type, or maybe it has to lean towards a family first. And it's gonna take a balance between those two. If those two become out of line, then, then you have, have problems. 
you think if we think of these systems, you know, when we think of a family system, um, you know, it's emotional concerns, you want uh, uh, commitment, uh, you have family needs, and it, and it strives for stability in that family system. And you think of a, a business system, it's a little bit different. You're thinking of performance. Uh, we, got, we have our, our business demands, and, and we need to manage change as we, as we deal with that in, in the business system. Many will talk about um, about having a, a business first philosophy and that that's the only way that this can be done. But what happens when that becomes out of balance? You give up things on the family side. You give up family communication. You know, if every holiday or everything is always about business and it's only business first, then you're giving up some of those things that really are the reason that you're in this business in itself, is because of family. So you can't have it too heavy lean towards one side. So if you too much on business first, you'll give up on family identity, uh, you'll lose some of the loyalty from the family, you give up on family time, and then family emotions. So just uh, looking for, for that balance. And it's important really to, to develop a, a shared vision. And by doing this, I think they talked about sharing stories. It's, it's a good way to, to bring in the next generation, bring in the in-laws, sh share those family stories and, and family values, and learn what you have in common with that next generation that's going to be the future leadership of, of the business. A good exercise to do is to take the senior members of the, of the family and the next generation that's planning to take over the leadership and have them develop a history of the family farm or family business. It's a great exercise for the senior generation and also that one that's planning to come in and, and take over. On the same side, you can't you can't have it too heavy uh, on the family because you need that income and it has to, you have to remain profitable. You can't always just meet maybe all the family demands that are there and, and take too much out from it. So if you if you too much on family first, you, you can give up on business communications. Uh, business relations may suffer. Your performance analysis uh, is not d done well your decision making might suffer also. And you also you lose out on maybe some strategic planning by, by focusing too much on the family side. So I, I work for that balance and, uh, and a shared vision. And through that shared vision then you develop trust, you develop commitment from the family and commitment from the business to the family, you develop business effectiveness and, and family harmony. And hopefully that's um, what, what you're able to do, and many of them in South Dakota have been able to do it, and that's why we're in our fourth and fifth generation of, of family businesses. I'm going to go back here and just, you know, we talked about how at the top you may have the family control, and on the right side there's the family forces and the personal constraints and the shareholder liquidity. liquidity so. As a family, you need the draws. Maybe you have owners, family owners that aren't involved in the business and they want their shareholder, they want a return, they want dividends. So, and the business has to grow to support the next generation. If there can, there can end up being too much conflict and too many demands on that. So that's where that uh, communication has to come in and you have to work out what is our commitment what is our commitment to continuing a business and how do we keep that going and how do we keep our family involved in it? If it becomes too, too stretched out, you'll lose that family control. As the demands separate, you know, and then maybe you lose communication and, and people won't, they'll start the arguments of, well, they're, they're 
taking too much out on the family. They're, they're way overpaid for what they're doing. They've gotten all the benefits of, of the family business. We haven't gotten received any dividends. We haven't been paid rent in 20 years. So all those things are things that have to be worked through and, and worked out. It's good to go through that exercise of, the, of what is your philosophy? Is it a business first or are we family first? And there's uh, questionnaires and sets that each person that's involved should go through and you can weigh those out and determine where your philosophy is and how that is split or common within, within the members of the family and, and in the business. And I, again, I look for that shared vision of, of both systems. So I got five C's that a person really needs to, uh, to work on and help you develop that. You need plans and policies to address these. You know, is the first one being control. Um, how, how will you address this? How, do you, how will it be done for decision making in the family and for management and for ownership of the business? Next is careers. Do we have careers that can, can support members coming in? What type of education do they need? What type of experience do they need to come back and make a successful career within the family business. And then capital. And we saw that, you know, there's, there's that demand for capital for liquidity to shareholder liquidity and also the demand for capital as you need to grow the business. So can we develop systems or policies that members can, of the family can in, invest in the business? but yes, also have that opportunity to disinvest or move away from the business and be paid for what they have put into it. So those things need to, by developing that, that they could have a chance to receive their money out of the business, to have the opportunity to exit, can also de help develop trust and make that commitment to, to join the business or be a part of it. And of course, there's conflict. In, if, if all our decisions or if all our problems are arising with conflict and we deal with them with, with uh, intense conflict, then we probably have to seek the, the professional help and work through those and get those things taken care of before we can move on and deal with good conflict or constructive conflict and, and work to win-win situations. So sometimes they become We've let the conflict go too long. It's maybe been hidden. We haven't talked about those issues, and, and we need to, to get some outside help, maybe some counseling to help work through some of those things before we can progress forward. And finally, the culture. I, th I see this as being really important. What are your values? Because you, you have values within a family that have probably been passed down. We probably don't talk about those as much, but they're what we have in common with those that are on the farm and those that have probably left the farm. And if we can work to find what those shared values are and then bring that back to address some of the other things, we have a culture for our family, a culture for our business, and we can ma help make that transition better. And really, all of it comes out with good communication. So there's one more one more C for you, and, and that is really the key. We do that in some of the programs that we do for, for transition planning. We spend a few days, uh, we do a, a three to four day workshop spread out over a few weeks at one day each week, and we work through uh, communication. We do a, a personality profile, a, a short one, but that's also a good step to take is maybe do a Briggs and Myers personality profile. It helps with that communication. So we do a lot of communication exercises so you know the, the ones coming in and know how to work with uh, your, your business partners and that, and that next generation. Another C that I'll throw out is a commitment and that's a commitment of capital or patient capital 
maybe for those that have inherited part of the business or own part of the business and, and aren't involved in the day-to-day -day management or work of it. So we want to develop a, a culture where, they, where we have that committed capital or patient capital that's willing to stay in the business and doesn't need the money right now, but is willing to settle for dividends that help uh, grow the business and help keep it sustainable for, for the family. Uh, ju I'll just use a, a quick example of, of using some numbers. So if we have a million dollars worth of a net worth in the, in the family business and we're profitable, we've paid our wages, uh, we've paid some rents, and we have 80000 um, left over to reinvest after we've paid everything. So we've got 8%, what I'll call a sustainable growth rate, which is just the 80000 divided by, by the million. So in nine years, we could double using that rule of 72. Okay, uh, divide the nine or eight percent into seventy-two, gives us nine years that that the business would be able to double, or we double our net worth. Now, think if we that same business, uh, million dollars in net worth, but could put one hundred and sixty thousand back yet, for whatever reason. So that's a sixteen percent growth rate they can double in four and a half years. So those are just things that uh, you need to think about, maybe a little bit with the numbers. Uh, I'll throw one more thing out, uh, and then we'll, we'll go on. Uh, I've worked, as you reach a certain size of, of sales and assets, it's a really good idea to, to develop an advisory board. Not necessarily a board of directors, but some outside advisors that maybe you get together with, um, share your financials with, share your goals with, help them, let them help you develop strategic plans. As we've heard today, and we're going to hear later this afternoon, there's opportunities in production A. And maybe it's not just, maybe the base is the farm, but maybe the opportunities are, are beyond the farm and still involved with a family business. So as you reach that um, size of, say, four or five million in sales, it's probably a good idea to have that advisory board and have them help you uh, work through some of these issues and help you develop a strategic plan. I couldn't end with uh, 13 slides, so I had to throw up a picture. and. Uh, Evidently, I'm not a very good cowboy because I was the one closing the gate, opening and closing the gate. I didn't get in the middle of, of the pickup. And that is my, my brother who's uh, retiring as a colonel from, uh, on August 17th from the Air Force this year. And my youngest son, as he graduated basic Army training in Columbia, Missouri. And then my nephew, who's a pilot for, for the Navy. And he's, fly, he's flying for surveillance uh, over in Italy as they were doing uh, the G7 uh, meeting. So he said, he said it was very interesting. There was a lot of business. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Jack. Appreciate it. We'll get settled here. And perfect. Thanks. My name is Stephanie Judson, and I'm the president of the South Dakota Community Foundation. And I was really honored to be asked to be a part of this year's Ag Summit, and really introduce the concept of philanthropy and succession planning and the role that it can play in developing both a successful retirement transition for producers as well as a, an estate tax planning tool. So I thought I'd start today by telling you a little bit about the South Dakota Community Foundation, what we do, how we got started, and the services that we provide in South Dakota. Um, the history of the South Dakota Community Foundation really stems back to Governor Mickelson back in 1987. He was approached by the 3M Corporation and the McKnight Foundations to, to start an entity that could serve the people of South Dakota statewide. 
And armed with $5 million in challenges, the leadership, including the governor, went out, raised the funds needed to obligate the challenge, and started the South Dakota Community Foundation 30 years ago with an endowment of $10 million. The mission of the foundation is to promote philanthropy, accept and receive charitable gifts, administer those gifts, and invest in a wide variety of social and economic programs in the state of South Dakota. We are a public foundation. We are not at all connected with state government, and we're here to serve the entire state of South Dakota. Today, the $10 million endowment has grown in assets to exceed $275 million. We administer approximately 800 funds and have award awarded nearly $100 million in grants and funding to support nonprofit and charitable causes, economic development causes throughout the state of South Dakota. So this endowment that started nearly 30 years ago will benefit the state of South Dakota for generations to come. We really have two arms of the foundation. That original $10 million endowment that we started with back in 1987 is our grant-making arm of the foundation. And so each year, our board of directors facilitates and awards grants on a competitive process throughout the state. And that totals about $500,000 in grants. And then we also run a program in conjunction with the Bush Foundation out of the Minneapolis-St. Paul area that it brings another $400,000 in community innovation grants to South Dakota. And so our board of directors is actively involved in awarding roughly $1 million to nonprofit and charitable causes on a competitive application basis annually. The other part of what we do is to provide the infrastructure, services, and technical, ser technical capacity for fund administration. And we administer a variety of funds that benefit South Dakota. We administer several um, agency endowed funds. Those are where organizations, nonprofit organizations, schools, other entities have partnered with us as their endowment building partner. We invest those assets and provide a portion of those assets back to them annually to invest in their organization. We work with communities across South Dakota. We have community savings accounts in approximately 80 communities in South Dakota. These are local community foundations with a, that are overseen by a local board of directors who raise money, invest money, and then give money away in their local communities. So right here in the Aberdeen community, there's a partnership with the Aberdeen area and the South Dakota Community Foundation. Just down the road in Webster, the Day County community has a foundation with us. Um, Langford has a foundation with us. Many, 80 communities across South Dakota, many in this area, in this region, have partnered with us to provide that infrastructure for them. Uh, designated funds are funds that are established by donors or organizations to uh, provide a stream of income to support a specific purpose, a specific entity. So we have uh, several hundred million dollars that are earmarked for very specific purposes in South Dakota. And then we work with donors who want to establish a donor advised fund with us. And they can annually, annually make recommendations over how those uh, dollars are awarded to support nonprofit and charitable causes that they care about. And those, they can make decisions on those recommendations every year. We also administer a couple hundred scholarship funds uh, that result in several hundred thousand dollars being paid out in scholarships across South Dakota. And so we provide a broad uh, array of services, really. We are the vehicle for people to accomplish their philanthropic goals, whatever they might be. I think I just... So we work to really promote a culture of philanthropy. We work with donors to accomplish their philanthropic goals. We work to provide resources and services to our nonprofit sector in the state. We work to build funds that support a region or a community. We also work to educate our professional advisors to make sure that they understand the role that philanthropy can play in estate and retirement planning. And we certainly work with nonprofits and communities to increase their sustainability long into the future. One of the things that I wanted to talk to this group about and highlight is some work that we have done in conjunction with the Nebraska Community Foundation. Back in 2000, we contracted with them to provide a, a study on the transfer of wealth in South Dakota. And that was first based on the 2000 census data 
And then we updated that, or had them update that, based on the 2010 census data to give us a snapshot over what the uh, outlook is for the transfer of wealth in South Dakota. And so I think that you'll find this information pretty useful. It guides the work that we do at the South Dakota Community Foundation and really speaks to why we feel there's a sense of urgency in trying to capture some of this transfer of wealth for our communities in South Dakota. There's an estimated $110 billion that will be transferred in South Dakota from 2010 to 2060. So a 50 year, one generation cycle, 110 billion with a B. That's approximately uh, $2 billion a year. If we could capture just 5%, just 5% of that transfer, we could build a $1 billion endowment. That $1 billion would offer between 40 and $50 million a year to support uh, our economic development and charitable and nonprofit causes throughout the state. And that investment in South Dakota would make a huge impact for generations to come as that continues to multiply over the years and decades. So the next slide I'm going to show you is how we compare to the United States. And it's, it's a very slight difference. On my slides, it's a red line. So the darker line is the United States, and the little bit lighter green line is how South Dakota compares. So we're trending very consistently as a state with the national trend in the transfer of wealth over this next generation. If we look at some of the individual counties in South Dakota, that's going to tell us a little bit different story. So here in Minnehaha County, for instance, you can see how Minnehaha County compares to the entire state. I don't think it surprises any one of us that the transfer in that county is going to continue to escalate and even at a higher rate than the rest of the state. Very similar story for Pennington County. You can see that trend line continues to grow and even surpass the rest of the transfer that's happening in South Dakota as we head into later years of this transfer of wealth. Let's take a look at Custer County. We can see that's a very unstable transfer happening over the next decade. We're actually going to peak in about the year 2025, 2030, and start to slowly decline for a period of time, and then, and then uh, continue to increase after that. If we look at Day County, just down the road, Day County is actually at their peak of transfer of wealth right now. They're going to have a steady period for the next couple of decades and then slowly start to decline. As, as they look at people leaving uh, their community, and as they leave the community, those dollars leave the community as well. Charles Mix County, certainly at a peak of transfer of wealth right now. And we'll see that transfer decline pretty steadily over the next 40 years. Hand County, even a steeper, sharper peak right now. And we see what it does over the next 40 years, 50 years in, in uh, Hand County. This information that I've shared with you, we actually have slide information on every county in South Dakota. It's available on our website. I've left materials at the registration table so that you have access to our website and can pull this information down, this data down for every county in South Dakota, as well as income data for that same county and population data. And I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, but it is what guides our work at the South Dakota Community Foundation. Examining the counties that are in the critical stage of the transfer of wealth right now helps us determine where we need to focus our attention in working with those communities to build community savings accounts to try to help them capture a portion of that wealth before it leaves their community. Many of you in this room are probably aware of a story that, that uh, involves the city of Webster just a few miles down the road. It's been in several major papers across South Dakota. It's been on TV. Um, the story of Phyllis Hansey, a local piano teacher. Phyllis Hansey had a trusted relationship with her attorney, Tom Sanis, and he helped her uh, with her estate and, and business plan. Um, she taught piano lessons for the better part of her career and just left nearly $5 million to support nonprofit and charitable causes in the town of Webster and scholarships for students going uh, in, in uh, Webster High School. So what an amazing legacy that she leaves that community, in large part because someone provided a vehicle. The Day County Community Foundation was established. People in the community were aware of the work that they were doing. 
She was aware of the work that they were doing, and she wanted to be part of changing the landscape of that community forever. <laughs> Here's some statistics, of course, that you're all very well aware of. Um, agricultural wealth has increased in South Dakota by nearly 200% over a period of time from 2002 to 2012, while the general wealth in South Dakota has increased by 70.8%. Now, we all know, coming from farm and ranch background myself, we all know that the impact of this really happens on the balance sheet. It's really related to the value of land prices as they increase so steadily during this period of time. And so for a lot of folks who may not have had a tax consequence at one time, they do now. And that's really what we want to make sure advisors and producers understand is that a philanthropic entity can provide an opportunity to reduce your tax consequences, which can let lead more um, to your family and to your operation. So more and more of our farming and ranching friends have taxable estates, even with the current exemptions uh, at the levels that they are. I think I went too far. Um, so current estate tax exemption is $5.49 million, almost $5.5 million per person, or $11 million per couple. In addition, the current gift tax exclusion is $14,000 meaning any one individual can give another individual $14,000 annually without it counting against your um, gift and estate tax exclusion. Um, so couples can give $28,000 jointly and, and should be taking advantage of that as they're, as they're looking to pass assets along to their, to their children. What we also want to make sure people understand is those highly appreciated assets, they can be land, they actually can... Um, also consist of other commodities. So if you would sell them that you would have capital gains tax consequence, you might have a depreciation recapture. Those are great opportunities to accomplish any philanthropic goals that you might have by first gifting those assets to a nonprofit or charitable entity, allowing them to sell them on your behalf. You avoid the capital gains tax and in some cases can even get a charitable deduction and accomplish your philanthropic goals in a very tax advantaged manner. So that careful planning um, can really be a great benefit to you. Uh, I just wanted to leave you with a couple of illustrations of um, work that we've done with some of our, our farming friends. Um, we worked with a couple that, I apologize, I'm kind of running off the, the screen here, but we worked with a couple who were interested in selling some of their land. Um, they're in their retirement years. They didn't have any family members that were going to come back and operate the farm. Um, wanted to stay in production at some level, but had a piece of ground that they wanted to sell to their neighbor. Uh, interested in, in selling that 160 acres to them. The land appraised for roughly uh, $3,500 an acre. That'd be a $560,000 uh, sale for that, that quarter of ground. And the basis in their property was zero. So the capital gains consequences, had they made that sale outright to that neighbor, would have been roughly $84,000, which would reduce their sale proceeds to about $476,000. These particular donors had charitable intent. They've been making gifts annually to their church and to several other local nonprofit organizations in their community. And so we devised a plan that would allow them to make a gift that would allow them to accomplish their philanthropic goals uh, and minimize taxes and still walk away with a, a nice retirement income. It's called the part gift, part sale, and we can actually determine exactly how many acres they would need to gift of that 160 to zero out their tax consequence. In this case, it was 35%, roughly 55 acres to zero out the capital gains that would have been paid on the land that they sold it. In this case, the donor sold, he, they gifted us 55 acres. They retained the rest of that quarter. We have 105 acres. We jointly sold to the neighbor. So the neighbor walked away with the, the quarter that they wanted and paid the exact same amount. They just wrote two checks instead of one, one to the, their neighbor and one to the community foundation. The donor walked away with 364,000 and some change, almost $365,000 in his pocket and made a $195,000 gift to funds that he had chosen, he and his wife had jointly chosen um, for nonprofit and charitable purposes in their community. 
It really eliminated the tax of $84,000 at a cost of only $111,000. They were able to, to benefit almost $200,000 in charity. So had he, if you see on the left, the sale, outright sale, the blue is what they would have walked away with had they sold it, and the red is what would have went to the federal government. And on the other side is the gift in the sale. Sure, they walk away with a little less cash, but they were able to fulfill all their philanthropic goals and all their philanthropic commitments that they had. And the only person that lost out in this deal was the federal government, not getting their tax dollars. So this plan worked very well for them. Um, another opportunity that folks have are uh, what's called the life estate. We work with a lot of folks who don't have heirs that are interested in coming back to the farm. Um, they want to stay, they want to operate as long as they possibly can, uh, but they probably have some estate tax consequences or perhaps some current income consequences. So uh, we've worked with individuals who have retained, gifted a portion of their farm and retained a life estate in it. In the year that they gift the portion of their farm to an entity like the South Dakota Community Foundation, they actually get a charitable deduction for a value of that gift. They can stay on the farm, they can operate, they can benefit from the income from that farm. And in the end, that piece of, of ground or that piece of property is left to the, an organization like the Community Foundation to benefit nonprofit and charitable entities, perhaps their local community savings account, and continue their family legacy in that community for decades. Um, I left some information, as I mentioned, on the registration table, both of our annual report and uh, some information on a program that we call Growing for Good. Um, this was something that we announced in 2014. We became aware from individuals that sometimes they want to gift a portion of their property, but they aren't really excited about having it sold. And so we have developed a land management program that allows for them to make a gift to the community foundation, and we can retain that gift and manage it for a period of time. Um, under certain conditions, and the net proceeds of that gift can benefit nonprofit and charitable causes as they've determined in their community. Here's the last parting thing I want to leave you with. When you talk about introducing uh, charity or philanthropy into a succession and retirement plan, this is really what it boils down to. Um, there's three buckets that you can choose to put your money in. And if you could pick two of those buckets, which two would it be? And so a carefully designed plan can allow you greater flexibility and actually a greater legacy to your family if you can eliminate or limit the, the tax consequences as much as possible. I've left you with my contact information, including our, uh, my email address and our phone number. Uh, I'd be happy to visit with any of you, anybody in the room about any additional questions that you might have at this time or um, in the future. I'll turn it over to Will if there aren't any questions. Feels like there's a load limit on this thing. Well, I also would like to welcome everyone here to the summit and thank the Department of Agriculture for hosting this and and also hope this is all a benefit to the folks that are watching on television. Um, I am a kind of a hand talker, so if, if I get out of your range, be sure and put your electronic beam there and, and emit a shock, so it, try to hold me in place. So. Um, we are one of the, we are the only program in the state with uh, the adult farm ranch business management. We're based out of Mitchell Technical Institute. Uh, we, we help farm and ranches with uh, record keeping, enterprise analysis, uh, and also we'll get into some succession planning or at least assist with some of the groundwork of it. We are not, don't pretend to be professionals of all the proper tools, and, and those tools do change all the time, but we, we keep folks in a good network of, of uh, we know who to contact to help them. Um, our program, as I say, is based in Mitchell Tech. We we go out on farms, so we are not in the uh, office very often, about one or two days a week at the most. I cover the southeast portion of the state, and Lori Tonak um, 
works at the south central part of the state. She lives in Kimball and, and kind of works out of her house. And uh, new hire we have here is Blaine Carey. And would you please stand, sir? He is our new northeast and north central instructor who will be, will be uh, Aberdeen obviously is included in his territory. So we welcome him aboard. This is our contact info on the bottom. I will also have that slide at the end. Um, I would certainly like to congratulate Lake Area Tech again for their award because I, uh, I'm a graduate of there, very proud of it actually as well. And I was wondering if you very intelligent folks could put your heads together and try to surmise who might have been on campus in the fall of 1984. How many weren't born yet? <laughs> so, Mr. Jim Clendenin, thank you. Uh, at some point in this presentation, you might uh, surmise that I don't do this every day, so uh, uh, play along with me here. And um, as I say, we work on out on farms and on kitchen tables. That is consider I consider that our specialty. Well, we'll get her one out of four, and we'll get her. Uh, Jim had commented at the awards luncheon that those instructors come at 6 a.m. to the, or some of them do, to the school. Well, Jim definitely came then at that time when I was there because we had a soils class at 7 a.m. We all learned what the word soil represents, and I still do. It is not dirt or ground. It is soil. <laughs> but I think part of the reason he came at 6 a.m. was to turn on the computers that we called then, and I believe your computer will fit in there now, right, Jack? Well, the computers that we had then were about the size of this, and the monitor was about that size. And when Jim turned them on, there was a vroom, and the lights all dimmed, and it took 15 minutes for the parking lot to light back up for the kids to come. So that's why you had to be there that early. I hope it's not that case for you guys now. They also taught us ingenuity. I added this slide this morning. A couple hours ago it looked like this, so jackknifes and, and phones can do that. So this, this slide uh, represents what, it's, it's part of our brochure, it's our program benefits, but it's, it's very generic for the topic at hand today. For succession planning to begin, we need to know where we are now, and to do that requires complete records to have to review to make management decisions, uh, and complete, I should spell that out like R-O-L-D-A-I-D-S, it's complete is a very complex word, and that doesn't mean just, oh, we start at the end of the year, we kind of let it go by the wayside, we tried to do some stuff when it rained, or this and that. Complete has to be accurate, and, and uh, cover the whole aspect of the business. It doesn't do any good to track bushels on, on three-fourths of the loads you sold and not the others. It doesn't really tell me much at the end of the year. Then obviously those good records make uh, tax reports a lot simpler. That's one of the first things I hear with folks that I work with in a program. Oh man, all of a sudden taxes aren't such a headache. Well, part of that is because we started them in a year earlier instead of February of the, of the post-tax year. Uh, the record management system, we have a certain software that we recommend to our students, but it's certainly not a requirement. I mean, there's a lot of good products out there. And the idea is to have a, a something that's generalized enough that other people that the farm works with can, can, uh, can utilize. Increased knowledge is the strength and weakness of the business. We do that by, we split the farm up into separate enterprises, whether it's uh, not just livestock and grain, but in the grain we'll do uh, each field of corn, each field of beans, each field of wheat, pasture is also a crop, all the different hay, and then the livestock as well, the, the cow-calf is an enterprise. She sells her calf to the backgrounding enterprise at weaning, and these are all things that take some time to get all these things proper, the inventories and the, and the weights and the dates and all that, and, and it's, when you're doing this on a per head basis, it's, it's very important to have all those things correct. And then by, by uh, 
doing those records, they're able to project a profitability, which, what, what do you need when you uh, are gonna come back to look at any job? You wanna know what their profitability projections are for the upcoming years. And ultimately, that develops a working understanding of the very important things that we need, cash flow, net worth, and profit loss statements. We had a, I'll be, I'll be referring to our annual report a little bit through here. And this happens to be a, I've robbed some slides from our 2016 annual report review. The farms in our program, we have an average age of 43 years old and has been farming 20 years. I just looked up the average age of a farmer in South Dakota is 57 years. So we are targeting, uh, we're not targeting on purpose, but that's the people in our program are generally younger. Family size is four members. They own 560 land, acres of land. Uh, I see our total, what they own and rent, they operate about 1,260 acres, and I believe the average farm in South Dakota was 1,395 from the data that I had. So similar size operation, just younger operators. And there's a split between own, cash, rent, and shared, and we had a just shy of 100 farms that were in this particular report. We have about 120 that we worked with in 2016. Uh, just some balance sheet figures that we had there. Current ratio has, there's no secret to anybody in this room, I mean, uh, and I don't want to keep dwelling on bad news with the drought and everything, but this is kind of where it's went in the last, last couple of years have really dropped off. I mean, our, our, our average farms are just barely in the one and a half, which is considered necessary. Our high return is in the just over two, and, and you know, it wasn't very long ago, the average farm was, was in that category. So, so our, this is the low 20% of the farms, this is a high 20%. And with that comes their working capital gross revenue, obviously has dropped over the years. This slide surprised me a little bit because, uh, you know, with the current ratio being that negative and our working capital of gross revenue here at 30% is still, still above 25, which is really quite well. And the and best explanation we could, or I could come up with that was, you know, our revenues are down too. So obviously you're, to make that a favorable ratio, you're, your, uh, one of your numerators in your equation is quite a bit less as well. Debt to asset ratio, our low return farms quite often are, are a lot more in debt. Uh, it's no secret as some of the, as the farms start out and, and try to build some equity, that's gonna be the case. These are things that people that, you need to know what these numbers are for your operation is what we really stress. We don't really, it's, you shouldn't really get hung up on being what position you are in a state average, but more so how you compare to yourself last year and the year before, and are we in a improvement trend or are we just stabilizing or what have you. Um, some of my profitability slides, we'll get to that, sorry. We'll, uh, we'll talk about that then. Uh, much of our numbers and calculations are based off net farm income. So we start up here at net cash income is just simply your dollars in, dollars out. That's kind of your tax, tax income, so to speak. Um, as many as you know in this room, your, your income taxes can be swayed by timing of purchases and that, and quite often the income tax income is likely not, is reflecting the, the year, what the previous year, the excuse me, 2016's activity will be reflected more in 2017's taxes due to, you know, whether you held over crops for the following year or same way with your cattle. So by, by uh, incorporating net operating, operating profit, we take that cash income and plus or minus inventory changes. I mean, a, a prime example of that I can recall was 2012 when the cash income for a lot of our farms were fairly steady with 2011, but their inventory changes just took a, a dump because they had no, had no inventory after the drought. We had, even though the corn might have been $7 a bushel, nobody had any. Obviously, that's why it was that high. So, so the net farm income is the uh, uh, 
income, less inventory changes, take off or depreciation, and capital adjustments. This is a number that we measure our farms by each year, which is an accrual base. And as you can see, net farm income, you know, we don't need to keep dwelling on how, you know, bad here, worse, and, and 2017 is not, you know, shaping up to not be a whole lot better. If we can just kind of stabilize here and, and move on from there. But our average farm. Thankfully, there's been some things that have improved since January 1st. I mean, uh, feeder cattle, back cattle have increased in price. Our grains kind of rally there and down and another rally again. But, but for a lot of my operations, things look a lot better with the exception of the moisture right now. But through the spring here, some things have uh, improved already. As it's often said, uh, good times don't last, but neither do the, do the bad. Here's some of the little bar graph that shows why, why it was so profitable back then and why we're where we're at now. The green is the history of corn and bean returns in the last, since 09. As you can see, we're talking returns of over $300 there, multiple years in corn. Would that be any reason why, as you know, some pastures got broke up, stuff that came out of CRP pretty soon had corn plants in it. Our soybeans didn't get quite as crazy, but they were still pretty consistent in here. And one thing I noticed on many of our farms last year, the soybeans were quite a, quite a pleasant, pleasant uh, return to the operation, still at, at uh, nearly $100 an acre compared to our corn, which was a loss of 15. Uh, one thing we encourage our folks to track is family living expense, uh, not and not necessarily dwell on, you know, like I tell them, you can't, I'm not going to sit here and say you can't go out to eat or you can't get a haircut or you can't, but whether you need to know what that number is, whether it's 30,000 or 130,000 or 80 or what, because that is quite frankly what, one that doesn't get tracked well enough and it's, it's things that your, your lender, you need to be able to tell your lender what it is. And I know we get a little flashback on that. We all get a little defensive about people wanting to know well, it's none of your business, not well. It is lender's business. You sign a note that you're going to pay this loan off in X amount of time, and if your operating loan keeps rising, you know, we want to know whether that was, are we borrowing money for family living? That's something we got to control. But I know earlier in the day we were talking about China's economy and that, how, how much they spend on food of their budget. Well, look at here. We spend more on on health insurance than we do food here in, for uh, our South Dakota farms here. 22% of our family living expense is health insurance. Now some of our, the green here is household expense. We don't always have this totally itemized out. So that is a, could be a combination of a few things there, but 
But uh, 57169 was the average family living expense last year. And you might think, you know, question that number or what have you, but uh, the high, low, and average return were all in that $55,000, $60,000 range. So it's not like anybody is out there spending 90 or 100 and there wasn't, there's just, it costs, it's hard to raise a family of four on much less than that. So some take-home notes here would be uh, obviously focus on working capital to increase revenue, cut expenses. You know, everybody's was trying to do that this spring as much as they can, and, and it's going to be even more, more important now. Um, obviously, consider debt restructure. That is certainly some of the folks have done that already. It may have to be done some more, if, if possible, in their operation. Manage risk. Hope is not a marketing plan. Unfortunately, that has kind of worked pretty well there in that 2010, 11, and 12 for folks. So it, it was hard to get people back in that cycle of, hey, I need to sell, you know, I want to sell 5% at this level, 10% at this level, and, and kind of graduate up off those break-evens. But know your numbers. Uh, I didn't, don't have a book in my hand, but our South Dakota annual report is available on our website. I also have some with us, and we'd be more than happy to share them with you. Keep a positive attitude. I think that's the most important, one of the most important things right here. You know, as we look outside, maybe not today, but the day before is 100 degrees. It's dry. Everything is parched. I've been, I farm myself. I've had a couple years like that where you just, oh, God, it's another day. Well, you know what? You can't see opportunities when, you, when you're looking like this. You have to keep your head up, notice things that are out there. Uh, I think of the things that I learned and my producers learned in 2012 how we can mix just about anything with wet distiller's grains. You know, I, I actually seen a quote for cattails at, at Rock Valley Hay Auction. I mean, there's just, you got to be creative on about many things. You know, if you don't have a crop to harvest, these young gentlemen, is there, I see all these wheat bales that are up. I mean, there's already something to truck, it seems like. You know, can you help a neighbor do some trucking or, or something? I mean, it's just... The positive attitude is definitely necessary. I think that's about my last slide, but uh, any of you folks uh, ever rent a piece of equipment and it's not always ready, ready to go? The last guy might not have left it ready to go, so you get to fix it. Well, we, we have that in our operation. Uh, we rent a manure spreader occasionally, and the, the outfit we rent from has three or four of them. So I had it. I got this all going and in working order one day, and I, I told the boys, I said, God, I wish there was a number on these so we could identify which one it is so when we get the next one, we don't get stuck with a broken one. In doing so, I turned around in my tractor and I took a picture of the one I had, and I said, it's, it don't have a number, but it's got a name, Jack. So I've used that, I've been wanting to use this slide for quite some time to uh, <laughs> reflect in your before or after your presentations, but as you can see, I don't know as I could have got that much fuller than that. I really tried, but, but uh, there you go. Not responsible for accidents, too. You even got a disclaimer on there. So with that, thank you, folks. Uh, here's our c contact information again. And uh, as I say, keep a positive attitude. It's going to rain someday. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Jack and Stephanie, and uh, good to have a little humor, Jack, you know, <laughs> it's good. Uh, any questions for the panelists? Any questions out there? I think Danny has the microphone, if anybody has a question. Oh, right there. I got the microphone. Right here, okay, we got microphones. Any questions? Oh, right here. Steve's got one. This is a question, question for Will. Will, what is the typical price for a producer to sign up for your program? It is a tuition-based program that currently is $750 per semester, so it's $1,500 for a calendar year. We do have some partners in the industry that are offering some scholarships to some of their 
customers and or some of our lenders have teamed up with us or some of their beginning farmers to, to assist in that tuition fee. It's kind of like anything, uh, seems like a lot to start with, but if you've after you've made that investment and two or three years later, it's like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't think of farming without it. And I guess that was my scenario when I was on the program myself for 12 years. So. I'm just going to reinforce that, that program, I guess. Um, part of the communication is knowing those numbers. If you, and, not, and being able to talk them and teach them to those that are maybe outside of the business and those that are, you're welcoming into the business and, have, and following maybe the strict accounting rules or stricter versus the half of the notebook or whatever is sometimes used, even on sizable operations. I, I really think it's important that um, you, you nail that down and are able to communicate that. It, it really helps. Thank you. Uh, question for Stephanie. Um, you talked about the community savings accounts. There's a lot of those across the state. Are there things that uh, certain communities are doing that are more effective or, or, um, or more sure. helpful than others? I guess. Sure. Great question. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll do some shameless promoting <laughs> for a philanthropy conference that we host every year that will be coming up this fall. Um, we'll be hosting that event um, in Pier first week in November and so we welcome any of you to attend uh, where we bring together not only our community savings account partners but other fund holders that are interested in sharing information on best practices and what works well but what we have found is certainly our, our smaller communities probably have uh, the greatest immediate success in, in raising those dollars and raising awareness because I believe they feel like they have the most at stake and at the South Dakota Community Foundation, we've actually carved out a portion of our grant-making dollars to offer challenge grants to communities to get those started. So oftentimes, we'll issue a $25,000 challenge to a community if they can raise $100,000. And we'll usually give them three years to do that. And um, that's a great catalyst for getting conversations started with donors who want to be a part of building that asset. And they want to have every uh, dollar that they give matched by one quarter. So that's a great incentive. And we found some great partners that'll help us uh, continue to issue those challenges. So that's always a great incentive. And we really talk about how, it is, how important it is to build that vehicle to provide that opportunity for people to give back. You know, I mentioned um, the instance down the road in Webster. We had another one out in the western South Dakota in the Sturgis community. You know, their community foundation has been fairly active for the better part of a couple of decades. Uh, making grants awards in their communities, hosting annual fundraisers. And, um, you know, they were recently named as a beneficiary of an estate gift. And so um, we have communities across South Dakota who are, are being named as part of an estate plan that can um, double or triple the size of their community fund in one opportunity, one gift. And then that family, um, just as we saw in Day County, can have a lasting impact and a legacy in that community. So it's really important for communities to think about the big picture, to think about the long haul, um, and making sure that they stay active and make sure that they're continuing to, I always say good grant making is good fundraising. My predecessors have taught me that. So if you're out making grants in the community, then people want to be a part of that and, and have a greater likelihood of, of uh, including you in their business and estate planning. So thank you. I know we've talked a lot about communication and we never really spoke about the avenues of that and and what I mean by that is communication on the farm should not be first time it rains let's lean against the pickup and talk about our future. Unfortunately that I've witnessed that firsthand. Uh, that process does not include the in-laws, the all the, the outside, the people that aren't, aren't on the farm each day I mean, a family meeting needs to be scheduled. Uh, you need to be open for agenda items provided by all involved. And one thing I've, what few I've had with my family, we, I really insist to, to uh, rotate who is facilitating the meeting. 
Otherwise, that person at the head of the table pretty soon, even though he's the tallest, you don't want him to be the dominating voice in there. So I just want to stress with people you work with that communication, I mean, you, you set meetings, we all volunteer for organizations, we serve on boards, you know, those meetings are set, and what meeting is more important than your family and your business? If not, let's give a round of applause for Jack, Stephanie, and Will. Thank you.